Welcome back into the We Shall Not Sleep podcast. Thank you so much for joining us once again for another episode. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm having so much fun doing these little shorter episodes, and I know I've, I've had some good feedback here as of late with them. I just had a meeting this past week with another guest who I think you guys will absolutely love. You may actually get sick and might not be able to get through the entire episode because we both have the gift of gab, and I'm very much, like I said, looking forward to some interesting episodes, uh, new content, uh, different topics that we've ever talked about before. I think you're really going to enjoy it. But uh, I, as, I, as I've kept with the theme here, uh, talking about kind of what I preached about what I've been going through with my congregation with recently, I, I had a um, kind of an epiphany a couple weeks ago. I ended up changing my schedule around. But this week, this past week, I ended up talking about evil and the presence of evil in our society. And it's a quoting that Kevin Spacey line from Seven is that the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And it's interesting to me that at least in our society today, it doesn't seem as if we believe that evil exists, or maybe we, we believe it does, but it doesn't really play out uh, every day in the mainstream. It's something that's maybe hidden, something that's more mystical in our society. It's not something that we find it's ever present, something that's just right out in the open. And how could it be? Because if, if Satan were to actually, you know, make himself manifest in our society every day, it'd be pretty easy to recognize and therefore fight against and, you know, make make it easier for, for Christians to overcome a lot of the temptation, a lot of the evil that, that's in our society. And I just think, at least in, in America today, again, in the cultural West, again, for the use, for use, use people uh, that are not, not in America, I think you have a greater appreciation for the presence of evil, not because it's something to be appreciated, but you, you don't take it for granted. It's not something that, that is foreign. It's not something that uh, you you just kind of keep in the back of your mind. You actually see the ravages of it every single day. And I'm reminded, you know, when you look at what Paul, what he writes in Ephesians chapter 6, what, what, I, what I love about this particular passage, you know, the armor of God, it, it's something that, yeah, it's, it's metaphorical, but there, he's writing it for a reason. And, and starting at verse 10 in Ephesians 6, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known the, with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in the chains, that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So you have, you have again, Paul, being able to to kind of put the emphasis always back on what what's the purpose here? What is the purpose of our lives, even in the midst of of trials and tribulations in his own life, his his words of encouragement is saying, you know, I, I still need courage because even through my present circumstances, I need that strength because we're not just fighting against flesh and blood. We're not. Actually, it's not even our real enemy because Christ told us that we're going to suffer for his sake, but we're suffering because people are listening to things that, that aren't God. Because if every single person on this planet was a Christian, fully devoted to God, would we as Christians be put in chains for doing doing the holy things in our in our lives? Would we be uh, you know not necessarily afraid, but would we live with the reality that we at least maybe not necessarily in America, but across the world that 
I'm going to be put in prison for this. Like, no, that wouldn't happen, right? It's got to be something. It's this belief. It's this aura that you know, what I'm doing, either I'm listening to the state, I'm listening to my supervisor, or I truly believe that Christians are evil and they need to be locked up, put away, or even killed because what they speak is blasphemy and it's dangerous, right? Well, if we have that type of understanding of our world, then praying for people, seeing lives changed, understanding that you know Satan does have a weight in this world. I mean, he's given authority, but what are we as Christians, what are we doing to respond to that? I think at least here in the West, in America, I think sometimes we, as Christians, we forget that evil exists because it's it's been like shrouded in mystery because Satan masks himself in idolatry and greed in this country, the the pursuit of pleasure and wealth and the storing up of possessions. It's not something very sinister. You don't see uh, us talk a whole lot about demon possession, and you don't see us talk about evil. We don't even like to use that word sometimes because that can come across as judgmental for whatever reason when it's you know actually applicable. And it's like, no, that's against the Bible. What you're doing is evil. I mean, Jesus, again, is the one who said, if you're not with me, you are against me. And I think Satan wouldn't want us to acknowledge his existence. He doesn't want to be found out. He wants to lurk in the shadows and and remain unambiguous. And at least in our society in the United States, I find that one of the reasons why I think our reliance upon God isn't theirs because we, we have everything that we need in this society. Everything's provided to us either by our state, um, through local business, through our employer. I mean, we, we have access to money, health care, food, shelter, transportation, friends. So we have emotional, physical support wherever we want it. And this idea that we need God when it comes to the things of this life that you know that are gu- almost guaranteed to us through the pursuit of happiness with this free market we live in, I think we truly miss the, the point of what this life is about. And therefore, the evils of this world can creep in in very subtle ways and not ways that, that, are, that are easily recognizable because it's, you can live a fantastic life. You can have a lot of possessions. You can have those quote-unquote blessings from God and they can still be used for very sinister ways. And I think a lot of times we think of evil, we think of hellfire, damnation, we think of a monster, we think of death, decay, destruction, which, which is always the end goal uh, of Satan, but he doesn't necessarily want to physically kill the body, he wants to go after the soul. And when we talk about things in our society that we can agree on, like like murder, rape, torture, ab- abuse of any kind, we all recognize that as bad, right? We all, we all can say that subjectively evil. Now, I don't know where our society gets the idea um, of ob- objectification anywhere besides the Bible, but which, again, I think that's our Judeo Christian root still influencing law to this day and in our, our inner conscience, which I think is where you can see God in every person because they are created, right, on purpose. They are created um, as a human being in the image of, in likeness of God. So, I think you I think people have that type of conscience. I think people can tune their heart to that. I think that's where you see the the unity of, of humanity is in our in our communal revile against the evil of this world, these injustices. But I think as the church, I think we are so distracted by our own schemes, our own missions, um, and then this is the hu- human aspect, that we totally miss some of the devils that are right in front of us when it comes to you know uninfor- uh, when it comes to um, d- dysfunction when it comes to lack of union, when it comes to uh, disagreements over things that don't really have anything to do with salvation. I think those are the subtle evils in our lives that we, we don't even acknowledge. We don't see as evil because we're in the way. It's like, of course it's not evil because I'm not evil and I know what I'm talking about. So therefore, right, it's, it's, it's a end result and it's always talking about something that I mean, you're always finding ways to justify your own, your own beliefs and why you're right and why everything that I do is good. Everything, every everything everybody else does is bad, and I am finding nowadays that when we are so distracted by each other, when our eyes are not fixated upon the cross of Christ, what ends up happening is that we end up allowing not just false teaching, but and and false teachers, but we collectively become numb to things that 
you know, 40 years ago, we would be crying. We would be loathing that, that this type of stuff is in our presence. And I, I guess giving an example is this this idea, you know, that that gender or sexuality is up to the individual, that it's not something that is uh, is not something that is determined by God. It's not something that was made um, and given by God to humanity, uh, but it was sacred. And the fact that a lot of churches are okay with humans just changing it and becoming lords and masters over their own body, which is so stupid. I'm just going to, I'll just call it stupid because if we truly believe the Bible of all Christians, we know that our life is not our own. We've been bought with a price. So I don't, when you talk about my body, my choice in any context, um, you're, you're, you're speaking to that freedom. You're speaking to that freedom that God has given to us. But at the same time, if you're a Christian, you've submitted yourself over to God it isn't your body no longer. It's the Lord's, and you're going to do what he wishes. Now, I know I'm maybe conflating two different ideologies, but our world has done the same thing. We've used that whole phrase, my body, my choice, in many different arenas now. It started off as one thing. Now it's just used ubiquitously across the board. And and that's something, that for me, it's like, well, I understand because you're, you're speaking to the agency. You're talking about free will, which, again, God has so generously given to us. But what are we using it for? And we become slaves to Christ. That's the language that Paul uses when he describes our lives after we've given ourselves over to Christ as his humble servant. So, you know, for me, that's just one particular area. Another area is is really this lack of conviction when it comes to what we consume, when it comes to songs. Uh, when it comes to uh, TV shows, movies, podcasts, th- things that I mean, I- I'm not I'm not saying that any Christian should or shouldn't watch like Game of Thrones, for example, or any other shows on HBO, Stars, Netflix, Prime, YouTube. But surely there's you know you, we all can agree on like hey, porn- pornography is bad, right? But you know when Jesus says you know if you in the Sermon on the Mount when he says you know for any you know you've heard it been said. But I tell you, anyone who has lusted at a woman has committed adultery. Like, like, wait a minute. Uh, that's kind of taking the whole thing uh, and, and turning it on its head, right? Well, I, you don't have to watch pornography to watch something perverse, sexually perverse, and actually have the conviction that it's still wrong. But I, do, but people want to argue like, well, there's different, there's different thresholds for it, and I have a different tolerance or. Like, well, um, I understand what you're saying. However, you know, like without that age old thing, you know, if Christ is right next to you, would you be watching it? Yeah, probably not. Probably not, I would imagine. And I, I just uh I, I don't I just wonder I just wonder if we are allowing the small devils into our life because we are so much distracted on what we want. I don't know that that's not that's not something that I can de- decide um, for you. That's something I I'd have to encourage you to seek out on your own. But at the same time, I there's got to be other lines in the sand that we as Christians can draw. And if we're not on the lookout for evil, something that's very real and present in our lives, and a lot of, and again in the West, something I think more subtle uh, instead of as overt as it can be overseas. Uh, more covert here that I don't know when you, if for any parents out there if you're not tracking with me think about your children think about what they can learn or not learn in school think about what they're exposed to on a daily basis when it comes to other friends things that are so anti-biblical is evil when there's when they're being chided for their their faith being made fun of those are small those are small manifestations of evil and our kids are being exposed to that and as parents if we're not careful if we're not being i say we I'm not a parent but the parenting generations if we're not cognizant if we're not tuning our spiritual ears and being on the lookout those evils in our life, we will pass them down to our children 
And if there's anything that gets people's attention is when we start involving children in the conversation and what we are teaching them and what we are keeping them from protecting them. The idea of sheltered, the idea of innocence and sometimes being made fun of, like, get out of here. Okay. You've seen, you've seen what the Bible says. You've heard Jesus' words. He says, you know, it's better for a person to have a millstone thrown, um, flung around their neck and then being thrown into the sea than to let any harm come to these little ones. Those are the words of Jesus. So I'm just wondering if, if we miss the mark sometimes because we're so distracted, we're so narcissistic, we're, we're so selfish in how we are supposed to live our lives. We're not at all aware of how it affects other people. What does our witness do to other people? I think that's a good place to start when it comes to discussing evil, is being aware of it in our own lives, in our own hearts. Anyway, that's just some thoughts, as usual. Thank you, everyone. May God bless you, and may God keep you.